So welcome back, everyone. We are now going to launch into our third installment of our oral history recordings with Nora. And um, she and I talked just after our the uh, after the the session last time, and we decided to go in a somewhat different direction to follow up actually on something that came up, uh, but that leads to a kind of a general question about uh, the uh, kind of work that Nora has advocated over the course of her uh, over of her career. Um, so Roberto asked last time whether you Nora ever saw a tension between what you wanted to do in your work or field work versus what people you worked with were interested in. And uh, your answer was a categorical no. Uh, that made me think of a frequently articulated stance from the 80s and 90s in which non, usually non-Indigenous linguists would pledge a 50-50 allocation. So 50% my stuff, 50% your stuff or their stuff. Uh, would, uh, uh, and so that my stuff then could be some linguist stuff perceived maybe as being esoteric, uh, whereas the you're there stuff would be things that are at the top of the stack for the, commu for the community collaborators. Um, uh, and it would frequently involve bilingual education, pedagogy, rarely for whatever reason would involve documentation or verbal art. Um, in those days for what that's worth. Um, so anyway, I find this interesting because uh, there must be, and actually I know there to be deeper issues and assumptions that make this a dichotomy for some outside linguists, but not for others. Um, and as we discussed between ourselves uh, last week, it would be nice if you could unpack that a bit and argue the assumptions that dissolve the dichotomy for you and uh, then how those assumptions led into your thinking about our program here at UT uh, once you came here. Well, uh, I'll try. This is, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to unpack it all and I would like help from everybody. And I think you've all probably um, thought or begun to thought about, think about some of these issues and it's, um, it's important. But I said no to Roberto's query about whether there was a tension between what I wanted and what you know, the people wanted, um, because I didn't find it to be the case. What I found was that people I worked with were absolutely fascinated by the kind of work that I was doing and teaching. And some of them uh, became linguists and some of them became linguists who got PhDs here at Texas. Um, and some of them became linguists who got their PhDs at other places. Um, so it seemed like the, with the folks that I was working with, there was a really good market, if you want to use that kind of terminology, for what, for linguistics, for what linguists do and for what they um, can teach other people to do. Um, I believe that is in part because the population of Mayas is so large, it might not be the case in for languages that are small that have only a thousand speakers or only 500 speakers, you might not find anybody with these kinds of interests. But because there's such a large population, I think people are able to, um, when they can get an education at all, which they couldn't really get until, uh, until the 1980s and beyond, um, before that Maya's, in Guatemala, at least had no education. They didn't even get through secondary school, um, but they began to be able to go to secondary school and, and ultimately the university starting in the eighties. And when they could get that kind of education, then there were, there were lots of things that people wanted to learn um, besides the, the sorts of things that everybody thought they should learn because they would be useful in the community, which basically were agronomy and bilingual education. Um, the point being that not everybody wanted to be a language teacher and not everybody wanted, wanted to be an agronomist, although some people did want to be those, those sorts of things. And as it turned out, there was a number of people who, when exposed to studies about language, 
liked it a whole lot and they wanted to do more and they did do more. And, um, and so I'm of course very pleased by that, but, but we did have people who wanted to learn everything. You know, they wanted to learn the, 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 the um, the theoretic, theoret, theoretical approaches to the study of language as well as practical approaches. And they wanted to do um, uh, linguistics in that context as well as linguistics in the context of, of, um, of, of just doing basic description. And as a consequence, we have a few linguists who are Mayas anyway, who um, all of you have I'm sure heard of by now, one being Balam uh, Mateo Toledo, and who is uh, really quite a superb linguist. And in his job, which is in Mexico and involves him teaching a whole lot of people besides Mayas, he certainly expanded to work on a number of different languages and, and still really likes to work on the syntax and really likes to get into it. So um, in all of these, declarations about what linguists could or could not do and should or should not do when they were working with native speakers. There was, there's a pretty interesting article by Margaret Spees um, that you might want to read um, in which she basically says that speakers of indigenous languages are not gonna be interested in the kind of linguistics that she does, which is MIT linguistics, um, pure and simple. And and, and so, and, and it's not useful to them is what she further says. Well, I kind of take exception to that. You know, if, if, if anybody can do theoretical linguistics, then why wouldn't it be interesting to the speakers of the languages at some point? It, it is interesting to some speakers of the languages. Some of them don't care at all. Some of them though get into it and really like it. And they get very interested in the theoretical aspects and so on. Um, so I guess what I think about that whole argument is, you know, give people a chance and see if they find it any of this gobbledygook that we do in theoretical approaches to language study, if they see if they find any of it useful, interesting, uh, or whatever. And as it turns out, they do find it useful and interesting, or at least the people that I know about who've worked on their own languages and have done some work on the theoretical um, uh, analysis of, of their own languages do find some of that interesting and useful. And, and why wouldn't they? I mean, it's just that the idea that because you're a speaker, you're not gonna find, you're not gonna find theoretical approaches to language study interesting. Well, why not? is my answer to that. I mean, or my question directed to people who say, you know, whoever, why would a speaker be interested in, and then they name some, you know, esoteric um, uh, bit of, 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 um, of theory. Well, why wouldn't a speaker be interested in such things? If anybody's interested in it, then you would assume that maybe a speaker would be at some point as well. There's nothing to, that says to me that speakers can't be interested in esoteric theoretical uh, approaches to language study. I mean, what are the assumptions behind declaring that speakers are not interested in that sort of thing? Well, I mean, the, the one assumption is that, is that speakers have to be interested in only practical matters. And if you, introduce people to something that's not quote practical, then they won't be interested. Well, that, I, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If it's interesting to anybody, why wouldn't it be interesting to speakers? And yeah, Kelsey. I, I think that often the answer to this question that you're posing is that linguists make it boring when okay. we explain it to speakers and we make it seem totally useless when we explain it to speakers. And I think that one of the things that's very impressive about your track record working in communities is that you clearly are really talented at making this interesting 
and useful. So I think that's part of it. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's me as much as just having a different set of assumptions. I assume that naturally people will be interested that if, it, if, if, it's, if it's worth knowing, then speakers of the languages will be interested. You know, it's just what we do is only, what we do is, is only not interesting if, if, if we assume it isn't. Okay, Ivana, your, so your question is, uh, how do you accommodate to what the speakers want to know? Well, it depends, I think. I mean, I don't really accommodate to what speakers want to know. I just put out there what I can, what I can do. And then if they want to know it, they stick around. And if they don't want to know it, they don't stick around, that kind of thing. Um, so if there are other things that speakers want to know, they will have to, in many instances, go to other people, which is to say, I can't teach um, pedagogical methods for elementary education because I don't know anything about it. And I can't teach how to teach a language because I don't really know how to do that. And so there are some things that speakers might want to know that, that I'm not the person to go to, but I do have some things that I can teach that speakers might want to know. And then, you know, I, and I teach them and I hope that they, they begin to want to know those things. Danny. I think you you made a, a really great uh, kind of aside about this, which was um, that you need to give them a chance to see if they're interested or not. And um, I think that the way that you approached giving people a chance continues to be dramatically different from anything I've ever heard of from anybody else, which is uh, your your version of giving people a chance was eight, 10 months of funded full-time research or study in classes. Um, you know, so, so setting up this environment for a very, very concentrated thing, right? And so, yes. um, so, so that raises the question of, you know, what, what counts as giving a chance? And, and I think compared to what you've done, I've never really given anybody that I've worked with a chance to, to have interest in or to, to really figure out if they have interest in linguistics? Well, yeah. I mean, I always thought that, you know, a two hour after hour, a two week after hours course was not going to cut it because you don't learn enough in that situation to know if you, if you like something or not. And that's where we get this intensive eight months or 10 month introduction to to linguistics, that's where it starts with the idea that if you're gonna, in order to find out if it's something you want to do and like to do, and you begin to think it's useful for your community, you need to put a lot of time into it. And the only way to do that is to try to set up some kind of intensive um, learning, teaching, whatever experience. And so that's what I did. Tony. Yeah, um, I just wanted to actually pick up on one little tiny strand that sort of showed up. Uh, the, uh, this discussion very often sometimes goes into a comparison of different brands of linguistics. So you do X brand of linguistics and uh, of course people aren't gonna be interested in it, but my brand, Y brand is uh, gonna be naturally uh, inherently interesting to people. And I'm wondering just kind of what your take on that is. Is it your brand? Is it, uh, I mean, so I would, I, I guess I would probably naturally wanna to try to argue that it's not about brands, that it's about uh, exactly what Danny was, uh, uh, was, was talking about and, and emphasizing, but I wanna know what you think about that. Yeah, it's not about brand at all. And let me say that among the people who have done this, I'd say that some of the most successful are, are me, Ken Hale, um, Judith Asin, Roberto Savala, and each of us does something very, very different. Right, and throw in Marianne Methune also. Well, I don't know right. if she's taught people much, has oh, she? she hasn't with Mohawk. With Mohawk, with Mohawk. okay. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with, um, with Ken Hale, he was a straight MIT theorist and 
but did all of this other work with speakers, which nobody else at MIT ever did. But his, his, his intellectual background for that was straight MIT theory. Um, <clears throat> Judith Asin went through every theory known to man. She was started off as um, working on Perlmutter kinds of stuff and went on to, you know, ultimately arc pair grammar and then ultimately gave it all up and went into pretty much MIT brand kind of things. But she tried every one on the way. And the reason she kept on shifting from one to another is she found them all to be not quite right. It wasn't, you know, it was just a matter of trying to find the right thing. And Roberta Savala, who is a um, very, very dedicated to um, functional perspectives. And Mary Ann, who is very dedicated to, what would you call it, Tony? Uh, doing- Oh, I would know, say functional perspectives as well, yeah. Yeah, functional as well, but also very much looking at the language and seeing what the language has to say about itself. Yeah. And, um, and me, who went into it with, from a descriptive, and, and documentary perspective, but uh, very, uh, very much of an atheist with regard to, to a theoretical perspective. Um, that's, you know, some people's heads work to, on data first, and some people's heads work on theory first, and I'm a data first person. I just, that's what I do. It doesn't mean I don't respect theory or don't try to get the data to be analyzed in a way that makes sense from a theoretical perspective, but I don't do theory, okay? And I think everybody has made of, so there's a lot of, of different perspectives that we're looking at and they've all worked basically. And they work because, uh, because that's not, the brand isn't the important thing. The important thing is, is, is working with people and trying to teach them something about how language works and something that they can figure out for themselves about how language works. And um, what I have found is that it was pretty easy in Guatemala anyway, to find some very smart people who um, had not been intellectually challenged anywhere else and loved this intellectual challenge. You know, if, if you asked them when they were 10 years old what they were gonna do with life, they would not have said be a linguist because they didn't even know what it was. But it turned out to be something they just loved doing. Danny. I was uh, wondering about your, your thoughts on this the size of the community that you're drawing from as well in terms of success um you know because if say say patty and, and carl maybe they're maybe if, if they were going to try to draw just from uh hoop speaking community they might have a hard time uh but if you're drawing from i don't know all of brazil or all of guatemala that's a very different kind of uh community that you're trying to get find people to teach? Well, I, I'd like to hear more from the people who do work with smaller communities. I'm not sure myself what the, you know, what the, what the minimum or the smallest community that you could work successfully and get them interested in linguistics would be. I have found that it's very easy in these large language groups. Um, there's always somebody, you know, so Kiche that has about a million speakers, it's very, very easy to find a lot of people who would like to do some linguistics and are good at it. Um, we also have some smaller languages in Guatemala. And when we worked on those, I don't think I got to that yet in my, uh, in my description of whatever I was doing, but we worked on four small languages from 2003 to 2006. And they each had about a thousand speakers or at least two of them only had a thousand speakers and the other two maybe were a little bit bigger, but still didn't have um, tons of speakers. They were spoken in one town each and that was all. So it was between a thousand and several thousand speakers for each of these languages. And we started off from the beginning with the idea that we were not gonna look for the same quality of people that is to say people who would dedicate themselves to linguistics and be good linguists. Um, necessarily, um, that we would look for people who were who knew a lot about their language and were very good at at um, being able to translate, being able to 
do all sorts of tasks with their language, speak it, uh, translate it, record it, and all those kinds of things. But maybe we wouldn't find anybody who would dedicate um, him or herself to the kind of work that the rest of us were doing. And so we assigned somebody from outside, somebody who was not a speaker of the language, but was a, was a Maya and was a speaker of some Mayan language to write the grammars. While the people who were speakers of the languages in question wrote dictionaries and collected um, and, and stories and therefore were the people who, who produced dictionaries and produced storybooks. Um, but writing a grammar is a much harder thing to do and we weren't sure we could teach people enough, enough grammar to be able to do that. So we don't have a good test of whether we could have taught them because we decided ahead of time that we weren't going to try. And so you'd have to have a test where you did try with some people and you had a, maybe a backup of other people who could write grammars if they, if they couldn't do it. So um, I'm not sure we, we, I'm not sure we were fair to the speakers and I'm not sure we, um, we gave them a proper test, but we felt like, well, we had to get some work done and we had to get it done in a, in a, in a limited amount of time. And if we're gonna to try to teach people from these particular um, towns um, enough linguistics to write grammars, it was maybe gonna take longer than we had and it was gonna be harder. So, um, and, and the people that I was working with agreed with me, but like I say, it may not have been fair, our, our estimation of people's abilities, but that's the kind of thing you have to watch out for is when you're working in a place or on a language where there are not so many speakers, um, can you do the same things? And we were afraid we couldn't. We didn't know we couldn't, but we were afraid we couldn't. And this is not just me, this is me and the other um, Mayas that I worked with who, who were the, the um, uh, who were running this program. And yeah, we thought it would be hard. And with, with finding people from a, uh, a village that only had a thousand speakers. And I can't say that we just, I mean, we didn't, as I say, we didn't test this, this idea properly, but I don't, I didn't think we were wrong. I didn't, the, the, the experience with folks who were speakers of the languages were Teco and um, Uspan Teco in particular. I didn't think that working with those people, you know, convinced me that there were great grammarians hiding in the sidelines who I didn't identify or something. I think we were probably right that it would have been hard to find people. Um, but we did the best we could. And so when you're working with a small group, I mean, that's, I don't know. Those are, the rest of you who work with small populations, do you have any idea about how talented people might be, Cuddle? So, yeah, no, so just to share my experience, um, it is actually very, very different than the two communities that I've, or that Patty and I are working with. So we started with the Doe community and maybe Patty can say a little bit more about that because she started that first documentation project. But what I could see is that speakers and community members were really invested in learning transcription and translation, but not so invested in like really understanding yeah, what, what are you actually doing? And I think it is, I see it a little bit as my fault since the project I was doing were really thematically oriented towards documenting territory. And that was something they were, they were all about it. So they were really invested in, in these kind of question and in these kind of activities and everything that was related um, to linguistics turned out to be more of a side project. And um, we have this one young man um, who is incredible, Pedro. And I always had my hopes up that he might be one of the community members who could go farther for a little bit, some steps further to maybe do an indigenous, some indigenous um, undergraduate courses in Brazil, in Brasilia. And once I asked him, I said, Pedro, why don't you want to do that? And he said, oh, actually, I just want to be dough. And then I couldn't say anything else. I said, yeah, that's actually great too. <laughs> so um, yeah, but with the NADEP, 
uh, with the Hosada community, it's at more or less the same size of the Doe community. It, it's totally different. I mean, I remember last year or two years ago, I talked a little bit about the community workshops and people are really invested in this. And uh, I guess until this day, I don't really know where that interest is coming from, um, but I can see, I can envision if we continue doing that work that maybe one or two younger people could like really start doing their own work so so but it might be related to how we set up our projects and what were our ideas from the beginning on so i can really see that difference in my own goals and how that may might have an, uh, an effect on the community i don't know maybe patty wants to add something i could just quickly add that um my experience like Carlos has been quite different across in my case three different communities um and there are a lot of variables so you know people are are interested on some level and in some aspect of what i've been involved in in the different places but in the hoop community for example almost nobody speaks portuguese so for me as a, a beginning researcher there even the possibility of giving classes on linguistics was sort of out of question because I, you know, there were only one or two people that I could even communicate with much at all in the beginning. Um, and then also the, the amount of education that people had was almost zero. So, you know, over time, there's become more and more interest in learning how to write the language and as we've been developing an orthography. And, you know, I think over time, this sort of engagement would build the Nadab, of course, already had a bilingual school that was successful. They were already writing their language um, in much more so, I think, than the, the Do. So I, I think some of these, these experiences correlate with um, just the degree of kind of interaction with the language people have had in this kind of meta way. But again, like Carol says, I'm sure there are things that, that I could have done differently as well that would maybe have done a better job of kind of bringing things to people. It, it seems to me though that this is a very good set of examples at related languages and where the situations were quite different. In other words, there's no hard and fast rule and um, you, have to, you have to see what's going on in your smaller communities. I think that if we had tried with the smaller communities in Guatemala to, to get some people really interested, we might've been able to do it. It was gonna take a lot of time and our funding was more limited, but we might have been able to do it. All right, Tony. Yeah, I mean, one um, <clears throat> uh, clearly in um, smaller communities, uh, there's there's sort of less um, possibilities or options. But maybe the question could be put this way: To what degree of um, directedness should um, the approach take? So I always think of. Um, uh, so let's take as an example, doing experimental linguistics, right? So you go in and um, you do a bunch of experiments with a lot of people, presumably, and uh, the, uh, the, the regimen is very, very, very strict, or even you could think about surveys or questionnaires, the regimen is very, very strict. And uh, the question then, that, that would be an example of going in in a very, very directed way versus uh, let's say going in and um, uh, saying, let's do a documentation project or, or the kind of project that Kaho mentioned where you're looking at, uh, uh, at, at, at questions of, of land and landscape. Um, those projects might shake out different interests that people have and then you might pursue those interests or those people might pursue their interests and things would be far less structured than um, let's say, let's sit down and write a grammar or let's sit down and do this questionnaire. I don't know, what do you think about those different? Well, I think they're so definitely forth. different. I, but I also think if you're going to be talking about, you know, let's write a grammar or let's, uh, let's any of those things, you have to teach people. You don't just do it and think that they're going to absorb it, you know, osmosis. And the same thing with, with, with questionnaires or with experiments. If you think that people might want to know what you're doing, um, you know, you take some people that you've already run so they won't prejudice your results and you tell them what you're doing. You have to teach it. It doesn't, it doesn't just 
It does not get absorbed by osmosis. People need to um, be told what's going on and why you're doing it and what you hope to find out. And I'm all for teaching it. And that's what I've been doing. That, um, you know, my whole professional career for too many years now is, is teaching people how to do linguistics. I've been teaching them as well as I could. And it's not been, I mean, I think people, there are some people today that can do it better, which is terrific. Um, you know, and, and, and some of them were, were started off as my students and now can do a much better job than I could. And that's wonderful. But um, I did what I could. And then other people, and then we got other people. That's another thing that I kind of innovated there was trying to get um, uh, other people to give short courses so that, you know, they wouldn't be committed to eight months or even one month, but they'd come in for 10 days and give a, give a short course on some particular something that they were interested in. And, and some of those have been really, really interesting and, and have developed over time so that um, we've found out lots of things. Uh, for instance, um, uh, Judy Asino gave several short courses, both in Guatemala and Mexico on, on, um, on complement clauses in Mayan languages. And that was very interesting for everybody. And it, was, and, it, and it resulted in a lot of really interesting data as well. And, um, and in a dissertation, Telma's dissertation was on complement clauses in Quiche. So it was something that, that, that a lot of people found to be quite interesting uh, to work on those particular kinds of clauses. So we had people had several opportunities to learn about it from Judy and she's a remarkable teacher. So it was a great, great chance for people. Anything else? Tony, you said you had another question. I blended it together with the question that I asked. So I don't have another question, but um, uh, one thing we could do, so at this point we could sort of continue the thread. So I guess one question would be how this um, general approach as you developed it in your work in uh, Guatemala and with OCMA um, starts to um, show up and transform itself once you came here at UT and in the framework where you've been teaching here at UT. Okay, there's a couple of hands up. Let's look at them first. Oh, sure, yes. Um, Christian? Um, I don't know if this question will, you know, maybe the whole conversation, but um, I've been wondering about, you know, when you are in a community as a linguist, your work is mostly focused on, you know, that, that, that stuff, uh, teaching people, but there are also other needs that, people, you know, sometimes come to you and see, well, maybe let's see if we can solve something through this person who is an outsider and has connections uh, out there. Um, so the first question is, if you had an experience like that and how you actually, you know, approach issues like that. And in cases that, you know, there are, I've heard that some people are creating like uh, ONG organizations or stuff like that, when they are also discussing, you know, trying to help people on other things that aren't indirectly related to the language and culture uh, in general? Um, I have not had the experience of people coming with to me and needing, needing help in some ways that I, for instance, wasn't prepared to give. I think they were, they figured out. <laughs> Okay. That there's some things that they might need, but I couldn't couldn't help them. I mean, you know, I'm I couldn't help them settle a land dispute. They never nobody ever asked me to try. Um, to put it in another way, I, I so I'm speaking from my experience, and what I see is that through you know the linguistic work that we are doing, or at least in this community, I see a lot of potential to you know try to develop other activities that will be useful for bringing engagement on the language through uh, other things like, I don't know, um, learning about the um, you know, nature in general or, or some uh, relevant sites that people are not interested in or some cultural things that non-Indigenous people might be interested in trying to know. Uh, 
and you know it could be also a good resource for for more documentation in general uh, but there is no i mean one person cannot do it alone i think and if you have an institution uh, other than the university you know a local institution can help and bring more um, attention to other members of, in the community so i don't know i think the approach from you know of having a like a ONG, as I said, sounds sounds good for you know trying to not cover all the, the problems we have in our community, but uh, helping somehow besides the, the linguistic documentation. I, uh, uh, your remark about one person can't do it all is is particularly um, interesting and and true. But when I was doing my dissertation research, I basically worked with two people, three people, really. Um, and I mean, we also, you know, got material from other people, but it was those three people who I mostly worked with, and they were the ones who um, mostly became, you know, linguists in one way or another. Um, but as time went on, the kinds of projects I was working on became bigger and bigger, and I was able to do that, make them bigger, because I... Um, uh, because I could call on different kinds of resources and so on. And, we, and I or the people I was working with were able to get larger grants for doing things. And we were working with uh, more languages and bigger groups. So we, you know, by the time we were working with 45 people, it was something like nine or 10 languages that we were working with, which is a, uh, it's really a, a major undertaking. And, 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 and we did work with, you know, many more people. Um, so it was kind of like you say, you know, you, if you're going to work with that many people, you, you may not have an institution, but you have on a short-term basis, some kind of institutional setup mm -hmm. because you can't as a single person work with 45 people every day. You have to have other people that work with them and other people that, that um, help. And yes, and more more problems come up because there's more people, and they and they 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 live lives that are full of problems. I mean, we had some people who came to us who were very very poor, for instance, and it uh, it made a difference because the, 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 they had the kind of poverty that was just really um, horrendously wrenching and, and, and coming and making a little bit of money and working with us was a very new experience for them because they'd never, well, in one case, he'd never had any money before, ever. And so the first time he got paid, he went out and bought all this tourist crap on the streets <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, because he had money. I mean, he'd never had it before. It was very, it was kind of interesting and sort of sad that, you know, people had to be taught how to deal with money among other things. That was one of the institutional things we had to deal with. Christian, did you have a, did you wanna intervene there? No? You say Christian or? or yeah, Christian. Christian. Oh, no, no, I just you know, <laughs> agree with what you are saying. And especially with, with, to me, it's kind of sad that some people are, you know, interested in your work just because of, you know, they are getting some money out of it um, also. It's, it's yeah, I mean, that happens. But, you know, some of them became truly interested once they had the oh, opportunity yeah. to do it for a while. And some didn't. Uh, some of them, you know, it was a nice idea to be able to participate. But in the end, they just didn't find themselves to be very interested and others did. But, you know, you work with people and you work with and you can figure that out. It's not it's not a big mystery when you're working with people in the setting where you're actually testing them and seeing what kind of work they can do, um, it, uh, it becomes fairly clear which ones can do it and which ones can't. And sometimes you have to, you know, with great, uh, with, with apologies and with, you know, not feeling so good, sometimes you have to let people go because they just can't do it or just don't want to do it, that particular kind of work. But it's, you know, it's part of what, what it, working in this way is you have to make these kinds of judgments occasionally. Roberto? Yes, thank you, Tony, for continuing this thread. I think it's, it's a really important question and hopefully relevant to um, a lot of uh, people's work here. Um, I, 
I, I, I think there was, I, I have a lot of questions, uh, but I'll just keep it to one. Um, I think, um, you know, Christian and, and Carl were talking uh, about very important linkages between language and culture um, and mapping uh, ter territory um, made me think about a more applied uh, approach um, and, and, and thinking about how language issues uh, really tie into uh, broader material, social struggles, um, land, anti-poverty, anti-racism, um, all of these important aspects in which language is such an important part and such an integral part um, in that. Um, I guess I wanted to focus um, my question on, 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 on two parts. One, Nora, you were specifically talking about you need to explicitly teach people. Um, and most of your work has been um, teaching people in linguistics to those uh, who uh, were uh, or convinced them <laughs> to be interested in them. Um, and, and within that, I was really curious about the, the teaching linguistics part. And if at one point um, you uh, thought about um, developing teaching materials to teach linguistics in these Mayan languages, um, and whether you need to use Spanish or Portuguese as a medium to teach linguistics to do work about, say, Quiche or Cachiquel, but instead having actual linguistic terminology and, 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 and linguistic textbooks, so to speak, in this language. And, and, and you hinted a little bit about this in terms of, you know, creating uh, other short courses for, um, uh, for, for native speakers to teach. And I think that question lends itself to um, deeper questions about scale and sustainability. Uh, and, 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 and maybe this will be part of, of another session, but you know, how do you sustain this work? How do you pass it on? Um, how do you uh, ensure that it, that it continues? It has been so, so successful and so useful and arguably transformative for some communities. Uh, how are you ensuring that this work is able to continue, whether that's a funding question or whether that has to do with uh, just the sign of the times, thinking about the Guatemala case and how there was a larger Maya movement going on at this time, starting and growing, and whether or not these language issues have to be connected to uh, bigger social issues or, or not, but I guess just those kind of that that for now that that main question of have you have, did you ever come across uh, developing uh, these teaching materials in the actual languages linguistic terminology in the Mayan languages that you were describing and documenting. Well, um, I didn't do that. I didn't even try to do that because every time I was teaching, I was teaching speakers of more than one language. It'd be pretty hard to use one Mayan language, which I was pre presumably not particularly fluent in, to teach people who spoke three or four Mayan languages. So I didn't even try to do that. I did have to develop my own teaching materials, however. At the time when I started, it may be different now. Um, there weren't any good textbooks. There weren't any textbooks hardly at all, and they certainly weren't good um, about linguistics in Spanish. So, um, so I wrote a book. Um, it's, it's not... It's no longer, I think it's, it should no longer be used. I think somebody badly needs to write another one. But the point of it was to get to use all examples from Mayan languages. So the book itself is in Spanish, and the, but all of the examples, almost all the examples are from Mayan. And every now and then there's an example from Spanish as well, but mostly it's from Mayan. And I think that's important because um, because I'm giving them examples of processes that I'm talking about that are more or less familiar to them because they're, the examples are given in languages that, that they are more or less familiar with and more so than they are with uh, European languages in general. So, um, so it, it's a kind of an introduction to linguistics is sort of a straight descriptive kind of thing. Um, where all the examples are from different Mayan languages. And so I picked them from Mayan languages I knew something about, um, which means they're a little skewed, but they're there and that's um, important. So um, as to whether such materials that were entirely in a Mayan language might be useful, well, yes, they might. But you know, it's not my job actually to write them. You need to have a native speaker of, um, 
of, of one of the Mayan languages, write them. And people have been working on that. They've been trying to get a vocabulary for uh, in, you know, say, Kakchikel or something like that, a vocabulary of, of linguistics, linguistic terms and so on. Um, it, it's taken a while. McKinsey, you're, you're nodding your head. Does that mean that you know about some of these efforts? Sorry, I got you in the, I got you in the <laughs> mid, mid bite. Yeah, um, in my experience with um, um, which is led by Judy Maxwell and a bunch of other people um, out of Casa Herrera, um, I know that she, when they go do like their like grammar lessons, she makes a point of using Kachikel terms that have been innovated um, for linguistic concepts. Right. I don't know if she's written anything up on it, but she uses them. Yeah, uh, probably may well not have written anything up, but she, yeah, she used them. She is a fluent speaker of Kachikel, which helps a lot. And, um, and it may be that other people who are speakers of various languages are also working on, on the terminology and so on for teaching. Um, uh, Luin Mateo and, and Balam Mateo both give um, short courses in, um, to people in, in, in the Anhobal area. And I think they, they teach entirely in Anhobal, which means they must have innovated a bunch of terminology for that teaching as well. Um, but that's mostly where it needs to come from. It needs to come from speakers themselves. Uh, and, and some people seem to be doing it. Um, oh, at Sonora, you had a copy of my book. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's really, it really needs to be rewritten and improved a, a great deal. So the fact that people are still using it is, is still a little bit embarrassing, although it does have, yeah, it does have some good. Uh, it, it was a copy that the students had for, you know, looking at some problems and learning a little bit about, or oh, learning about morphology in general from, right. you know, actual examples from, from Mayan languages, yeah. All right, oh, and you know, if you work on a Mayan language, you're gonna say a lot about morphology, so it works for that. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the problems are very good. I just think somebody needs to modernize this and it's not gonna be me. I wrote one book, somebody else needs to write the second. And let me tell you, trying to write a book in Spanish when my Spanish was still kind of weak, um, it was really, really, really hard. That was the first time I tried to write in Spanish. Um, now it doesn't scare me as much. I've wrote, wrote a subsequent book, which I think is much better, which is an introduction to Mayan grammar and also using examples from different languages. So it's kind of a grammatical sketch, but not tied to a single language. And I think it could be very useful to people to have that as well. So, so when, I, when I thought about that and how it might be useful, well, I had to write it because it didn't exist. That's another thing that That'll happen sometimes if you don't have materials, you know, you can't, you just can't go around talking about how you don't have materials and bemoaning the fact that you don't have materials. If you don't have materials, you got to make them. And so I did with three books, because the, th the third one was uh, trying a kind of an introduction to the history of Mayan languages, which I think people didn't know anything about. They knew that you could know something about it, but they they didn't themselves know anything about it because nobody ever said anything about the history. And I think people wanted to know. So I wrote some, something about that. I'm not, um, I'm not a historical linguist, so it probably could be improved a lot by being rewritten by a historical linguist. I'm looking at Danny. Um. <laughs> I felt like you were looking at me, even though you can't tell on Zoom. Right. I, I was one, one little thing I wanted to bring up with Roberto's question is that uh, it strikes me, and I, I, I'm curious what you think about this, Nora, but it strikes me that writing about um, linguistics in a, an indigenous language, because it involves creating a bunch of new words, is, is a highly political act, similar to coming up with a standardized form of the language and, and that's, among other things, is another good reason that it really should be speakers of the language that are kind of leading the charge on it. And, and outsiders, in some ways, it seems, it seems to me that it might be even kind of inappropriate for an outsider to be uh, doing that kind of work. 
Uh, no kind of about it. I think you're right. It would be very inappropriate because of the political implications of all of that. And also because, I mean, it, in the past, in all of these places um, in Latin America, there has been an outside group that's come in and said, okay, we know everything and we'll write it down for you. And it's such a paternalistic attitude. And that has happened in a bunch of places. So largely, um, the SIL has done that for the ELV, as they say in Spanish. Um, and uh, it just, it's, um, it does not have good results, let's put it that way. When you go in and you tell people, okay, we'll solve all your problems. We'll write it down for you so you can understand it, blah, blah, blah. And you got to do it in a much more collaborative way. And so, or, you know, talk to people if you think it's a good idea to have some kind of material and try to get them interested in doing it, not you. Um, the, one of the points of all of this training, to my mind, the main point is that if there is going to be somebody who is going to be making decisions of any sort about this, about a particular language, speakers need to be involved. And one way for speakers to be involved is for them to know what the issues are and to be able to have opinions about the issues and express those opinions. And one way they get to have that knowledge is to, is to study linguistics. And so then they can make um, pronouncements, basically. They can, they can say things about what the decision-making is. It, often, it most often comes up in the standardization of a language, which is just very highly political, but there's some other things that, that go along with that. So standardization is the first thing you think of though. And I think um, it's been mentioned a few times and it is very political and it's something that people are interested in um, for various reasons. And, and it's also very difficult if you have much variation in the way that the language is spoken in different areas. And with Mayan languages, you do have a lot of variation that makes standardization, you know, pure um, uh, hell, actually. And for some of them, it's just very difficult to standardize. But, but it can be done. And um, Kachikau is a good example that people are really standardizing in Kachikau. And um, to the extent that if you ask them a question about the language, they're likely to give you the standardized form as a response, which means you have to really dig into what people are telling you for your own field work because you probably don't want to get the standardized form as the only response to your question. You probably want to get, you know, what do you actually say rather than what you think everybody ought to say? And so it's, uh, it's a, it, Successful standardization efforts make linguistic field work harder. It just that's it's kind of a, a rule. Okay, the um, I'm not sure I finished answering Roberto's question, but uh, okay, I did not personally develop any mat teaching materials in a Mayan language, as 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 Mackenzie said. They have been developed for some Mayan languages, um, Kachikel in particular. And Kachikel has been, in fact, the lead language in a lot of all of this, in the efforts for standardization, in the efforts to um, create neologisms that work, and um, a lot of sort of modernization. They've been the, the, the leaders, and it's been a very interesting process to watch. People are highly committed to it. And so you get people being very committed to, you know, finding the right word that's not Spanish that comes from Cartuquel roots for this concept, whatever it may be. Um, it's just a, it's a really fascinating process. And so you guys who have some interest in, you know, language and culture, language and society, this is a great place to look. And in Cartuquel the, the, is where there's been the most success and the, and the biggest efforts among Mayan languages. And, they, they, and the, and the, the success and the, and the highest effort have come about because Kachikel speakers are behind the 100% uh, behind the drive to, to, to modernize with uh, the kind of vocabulary that will work in these languages and, um, and to standardize and so on. So that 
it, it's coming very much from speakers themselves, the whole effort. Um, but so I did develop teaching materials, but they were not in Mayan languages, although they used examples entirely from Mayan languages. So that would be the, um, what I did. And I think, like I said, I think the teaching materials have to be, um, have to be rewritten by somebody who's, by a Maya who's become a linguist. That none of them seem to want to do it though. So, I mean, I've been trying to, you know, suggest this. Well, somebody needs to rewrite this book and not modernize it. How about you? And they say, oh, no, <laughs> they have other things they want to do. So it's not high on anybody's list, I'm afraid. And partly because some, some book exists, right? So, okay, anything else, Tony, that you want me to talk about in the last few minutes? Well, I don't think we have, uh, uh, we don't have that much time. I mean, I just want to say that one thing that just comes to my mind from listening to you about all of these things that, um, uh, that you're an activist and an activist for what? And it seems to me that you're an activist for intellectual justice, really, that the framework that you're talking about is really bringing out um, intellectual um, um, uh, resources, intellectual capacity wow. in communities, and trying to uh, trying to really uh, flesh that out. And language couldn't be a better arena for that. But we have to be able to talk about it in in technically appropriate terms. So you're trying to leverage linguistics towards intellectual justice. Thank you, Tony. I think that was very well put. And I think I think you're probably right. But I'm, thank you for for stating it in a clear and um, clear way and one that um, and I'm grateful that you put it in those terms really and 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 you're right that uh, the point of all of this is that with regard to language to have control of your own language you have to be you have to have somebody or other who is who is contributing to the issues about that language because they know how. And if there's nobody in your community who can contribute, then you don't have control. And you're always you know, listening to some outsider like, like linguists or, or educators or politicians, and they're telling you what to do with your language. But so if somebody or other in your community has control, that is to say, can do all of this for themselves, then, then yes, you're, you're much, in a much stronger position. And I think that is crucially important. So yes, it has to do with intellectual um, matters. Everything that I've been talking about or trying to say has to do with strengthening the public intellectual um, contribution that speakers can make. And somebody put up a note that Gladys, that you were doing some of this kind of work. And I said, what I say is, Keep it up. Keep going. It's 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 crucial. 